All right. I'm going to, if it's okay with you, Ed, I'm going to, I'm going to launch. And um, so it's, I'm thrilled to have Ed back, but um, Ed is not just back. The two, two or three most important things that I've got to say about Professor Ed Lee is that he's a professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery. One, one, something I'm exceptionally proud about. Okay, um, he's also a senior investigator at the Allen Institute of Brain Science, um, and uh, he's an affiliate professor in lab medicine and pathology. Dirk kind of snuck that up on us. Okay, um, but he was first a professor in neurological surgery. He did his, uh, he's a Midwestern guy, started out as that. He did his undergraduate degree in engineering uh, in, at Purdue University and his PH, PhD at UC Berkeley. And uh, he did his postdoc work at the Salk Institute. He, he joined um, uh, the Allen Institute in 2004 and was the uh, brains behind, brains and brawn behind the uh, creation of a, the large scale anatomical cellular and gene expression atlases of uh, adult and developing mammalian brain. Um, um, so he did the first mouse atlas. He, he's very modest about that. Um, and he uses uh, single cell genomics uh, to try to understand cellular organization and uh, uh, and mammals in general. Um, he, this this kind of led to the formation of the human cell types department, uh, which one of the things they do is create atlases of human and non-human primate brain. But as a part of that, he does a lot of translational work. Uh, and I, my relationship, this, this is not about neurological surgery, but uh, Dirk, myself, and Ed started looking at the transcriptome in um, TBI patients, and that's how we got to know each other. And then the techniques that Ed and Dirk have developed have now been used on a host of uh, brain problems such as Alzheimer's, and they have a huge one of the hugest uh, grants on um, on uh, on Alzheimer's and and, and so on. Uh, um, Ed defies description as a scientist. He, he, he's a basic scientist trying to understand cell types, and he works on uh, uh, disease. It, it, initially, not, but now he is. Uh, uh, pioneering the pathway for using these single cell sorts of approaches to understanding disease states. Um, so without going on, Ed is in my eyes and Dirk's eyes and uh, our colleagues' eyes, a unique and a very special, brilliant scientist. And we're just honored to be associated with him and uh, draft behind him most of the time. Uh, uh, hopefully, um, Ed, I didn't, um, I didn't uh, overstate um, your importance, but uh, that's how important you are to all of us. So thank you, Ed, from the department. You've always inclusive. Uh, when he publishes papers in this, he, he includes all the members of this department that have participated or contributed to his paper. It's pretty amazing. So anyway, um, I can go on forever. Ed, please give us your talk. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, it's a hard intro to follow, I have to say, um, but uh, really grateful and the feeling is mutual for being able to work with all of you as well. Um, so let me get my presentation up here. Okay, can you see that and hear me? Yes, okay. we can see that beautifully. Fabulous. Okay, um, I'm really happy to have the chance to give you an update on our progress, uh, both on normal brain and Alzheimer's brain. Um, you know, the, the pace of research is is just dramatically accelerating. And I'd like to give you, you all a flavor of the latest developments in this field of creating these atlases, and then uh, how we can use these atlases and how these may be relevant for, uh, for all of your research as well, uh, and potentially even the clinic in the future. Um, let me just begin by, by a, a slight disclaimer. Um, my laboratory does some sponsored research with uh, biomarine pharmaceuticals. This is not relevant for day, today's talk. Um, so really to kind of set the stage for, for what I'm going to tell you about. 
we're really kind of in the midst of, of what I consider to be the, the next human genome project. Um, the tools of genomics have really opened up the ability to understand the cellular organization of the brain and of every other organ in the body. And there are major efforts now um, in the brain through the NIH Brain Initiative um, and being coordinated across, uh, across the various organ systems through projects like the Human Cell Atlas uh, or NIH's uh, HubMap program. And uh, really this, this is a testament to the power of these genomic technologies, single cell technologies, to be able to describe the cellular complexity of very complex systems and to do it with a common language that works across uh, different organ systems. So by using genes as the metric for defining cell types, um, you can speak the same language with a cell in the heart or the liver or the brain. Um, and just to sort of <clears throat> hammer on this point, um, just to set the stage for how these are applied, you know, single cell genomics, initially this was transcriptomics. Now this has been applied to other things. Epigenomics, for example, to look at the state of chromatin are extremely scalable techniques that can be applied to either cells or nuclei. <clears throat> so you can take a part of the brain, for example, dissociate the cells or the nuclei and profile the set of genes that's actively being used in those cells. And you can do this across thousands, even millions of cells now. And that becomes a rich information vector to be able to cluster and classify the types of cells that make up um, that brain region. And using that then as a reference, <clears throat> you can formalize that reference into a, a classification of types that now forms a, a foundation that you can start to layer on additional information from or test the properties of. So for example, to characterize the physiological properties, the connectivity or the function or the anatomy uh, of those cells. And it turns out sort of long story short that those other cellular properties correspond uh, quite closely with the, with the molecular properties. And so this becomes a, a meaningful way to classify cells. It's also a way to start to develop tools that allow you to selectively target those cells genetically, as I'll tell you about later. So it becomes a very, very um, um, robust and, uh, and important framework for being able to describe the system and then do something with it. <clears throat> the paradigm for this was really set up through the NIH Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, um, where uh, the idea was to apply the various tools of the day to really densely characterize one part of the brain initially and the whole brain eventually. Um, many different groups uh, participated in this with different types of methods to look at the same region of the brain and see if we could define the complete cellular makeup of that part of the brain. <laughs> I won't belabor this point. This has been published for a few years. There was a publication package around this, in fact. Um, but the, the outcome of this is a classification or a census of cell types that make up that part of the brain. Um, this is fundamentally based on the transcriptome, on the set of genes that are actively used by these cells. <clears throat> but um, And it can be represented as sort of a, a hierarchical organization. It's quite complex for any brain region, but it's definable and it's organized. And <clears throat> that hierarchy represents sort of major classes, neuronal, non-neuronal, uh, different types of neurons, working your way down to cells that came from different developmental zones, for example, and all the way down to these very fine cell types, like a chandelier cell, for example. Um, and so this, this atlas is a description of the types, but increasingly it's a highly annotated and curated set of information that contains the cell types, their gene expression profiles, their epigenomic states, the spatial organization of the types, their relative proportions, and the properties of those cells. <clears throat> and so like the genome, the, this cellular classification then becomes an increasingly sort of rich characterization of those types. <clears throat> Fast forward two years, it's totally remarkable. The scalability of these techniques has moved from this single brain region to the entire brain. And um, my colleagues at the Allen Institute on the mouse side have driven one of the main uh, projects in the mouse. This has now produced a complete description of the cell types using those technologies across the mouse brain. It's extremely complex. There are about 5,000 types of cells that one can define on the basis of, of their transcriptional properties. And we have not only a, a description of these, this big uh, UMAP uh, in the upper left here is an attempt to represent 5,000 plus cells uh, in two dimensions. Uh, it's very, very complex, but 
that can now be mapped using spatial methods on tissue sections, like that original Allen mouse brain atlas that was one cell at a time. This can be now, now done 500 genes at a time, which is enough to identify every cell in the context of this reference classification. So we now have a first description of a mammalian brain. At the same time, uh, we've been applying these methods, uh, working with Sten Linnison at the Karolinska Institute, to the human brain, and really done a, a very um, good first draft atlas of the human brain that's already uh, described about 3,000 types of cells distributed across many brain regions. <clears throat> and many of the same organizational principles are seen across these. So uh, in just a very short amount of time, I'm sort of moving from, uh, from targeted descriptions, methods development to large scale application to get these whole brain atlases. Um, I really wanna emphasize how important it has been to work with all of you uh, at the University of Washington, other colleagues at the Swedish hospital to have access to these extremely high quality tissues, both on the post-mortem preparation side with Dirk um, and on the neurosurgical resection side, as I'll be illustrating over the talk, um, how we can use these and how it's really opened up new fields of basic human neuroscience and eventually translational science. It's been totally essential. I'm incredibly grateful for, for all of you for working on that. And just to really sort of illustrate this, this work in the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network has resulted in a whole suite of publications. And there's actually a publication package in the works, but there, uh, I wanted to highlight that there are eight papers that the Allen Institute has been involved with. Um, uh, five of these have been fully driving and then collaborating with others who are sharing this tissue um, through Dirk that were, were reliant on these high quality human brain specimens <clears throat> and have led to extremely high profile work that's sort of pioneering this field to look at diversity of cell types across the brain, across the pop a population of individuals, across species, um, using the surgical tissue to look at the properties of cells for the first time and to look at other, other data modalities as well. And it, it really has brought the technologies of, of the model systems to their real application to human tissues. And so I re really want to highlight that how important that's been, not just for the Seattle community, but really for um, basic human neuroscience as a whole. <clears throat> okay, so um, we've now moved into the next phase of the brain initiative. The success of being able to do this on human tissues led to uh, the next phase, which is really focused on human. And so the, the BICCN has become BICAN, the Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network, another large scale effort uh, that is uh, principally focused on human or non-human primate model organisms that are much closer uh, at this point. And uh, we're deeply involved with this um, along with Dirk and other colleagues um, uh, here at University of Washington as well. Um, the project that that uh, that we've proposed is really the big atlas project, and this is something the Allen Institute is particularly well suited to to do because we've been doing this for many years. Where we're really trying to see if we can handle the scale factor and create whole comprehensive brain atlases. So what I showed you earlier is a draft, but create whole brain atlases to take this comparative strategy as a really fundamental component of how we do this, because it allows us to map homologous structures or understand what's distinct or specialized about human and do this in human, marmoset and macaque to use this suite of technologies uh, that I've just described here of single cell genomics, spatial methods, spatial transcriptomics. And then what I'll get to later is characterizing the cells in living tissues as well. And to take, take this to the next level of trying to connect different parts of the field and different scales. So we can link functional organization with this cellular and molecular organization. I'll come to how we're gonna go, uh, go about doing that. So the big goals of the, this project are to create these classifications across the entire brain. And we want to do this within each species, within human, macaque, marmoset, uh, connecting to the mouse, but also across species, because it's really important to be able to, to compare human to model organisms. And we can do this quantitatively now with these data sets. So one is a classification. This is sort of the genome. Uh, the second is the spatial organization of the tissue organization that we can use these spatial methods to now map these distributions so that we can understand what the basic organization is, uh, which is also an important baseline for understanding what might go awry in disease. And then finally, to integrate all these things, to integrate function, um, cellular organization, molecular organization, into new 
spatial common coordinate frameworks into spatial references that would allow functional imaging to be mapped in, to allow samples coming from all these different cellular analyses to all be in the same framework so that they can be compared. These are huge projects. And this project is only one of part of this uh, Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network, but it's a it's a very large one. That the methods, or the the goals that I've just described, require a lot of different expertise. And so this is really kind of a new way of doing science: is to bring in all of these things into singular projects that they can, that people can all work together and bring their relative expertise to these much much bigger goals. And so we've got um, not only the team at the Allen Institute. Also, uh, all of our, our close colleagues in this front at the University of Washington, Dirk Keen, Tom Krabowski, Christine McDonald, Kimmy Demoto Riley, uh, Tim Brown, for example, and expertise in imaging, in um, macaque and marmoset brain research, in patch seek to sort of globalize this effort of, of uh, characterizing living tissues, for example. So um, it's a big challenge. I really want to sort of highlight like how we're going to try to ta tackle these challenges. Um, it is a huge scale factor to go from mouse to human. It's about a thousand times bigger. We've got this new challenge <clears throat> of how to link the functional side to the cellular molecular side. And then when we get to characterizing the cell types, you know, human brain has about a hundred billion neurons. And as, as I described in the mouse, likely about 5,000 cell types. And so this becomes an extremely uh, big challenge to think about how to characterize and, uh, and add that information to a classification. So a couple of things to, to sort of help here. One is that a, a key thing that makes this even remotely feasible is that there, it turns out with these molecular techniques that we can really establish that there's a high degree of homology of the basic cellular organization across mammals. Uh, we, we've been able to show that um, you see a similar organization in any given part of the brain um, looking in human or in, in a monkey or in a mouse. You can quantitatively align uh, these classifications based on conserved patterns of gene expression, and you can create a consensus classification. Um, this is important for a number of different reasons. It allows us to infer properties that you can only measure in a model system, for example. It allows us to evaluate whether a given model system is a good model for a human. Uh, but pragmatically here, it's a target that we can try to match as we're sampling the human brain. It becomes a sampling problem um, to try to match if we see complexity in the mouse that we haven't seen in the human, we've most likely missed something and can resample that. Still a large brain, so um, we have to have sampling strategies to make this feasible. Um, one of these is to guide based on atlases. And those atlases are both sort of structural atlases that uh, that we understand the, the, the cytoarchitecture and the makeup of nuclei, as well as um, atlases coming from the imaging space, where there's a very rich field of defining cortical parcellations in particular. We can use this as the sort of driving force for how we build this atlas. The second idea is that we really want to use function as a guiding principle for how to sample. Ultimately, we're trying to understand what the cellular and molecular underpinnings of functional organization are. And to do that, we actually have to do this within a given animal where we, we can, or human, where we can measure the functional organization in that individual, and then ask questions about what varies between different regions. This is important because there's enough individual variation between uh, between individuals that you can't accurately predict these things. You actually have to measure them. So this is a benefit of bringing in the comparative strategy that we can actually do that. And then finally, once we have this classification, then that can drive the downstream elements of characterizing those things. So if we have a molecular classification, we can use that to derive genes that can discriminate among the cell types and map those in space. We can use that classification as a guide to begin using functional characterizations of individual cells to characterize those cells. So a little bit more detail uh, for the human side, we're intending to use as the, as the primary uh, way to approach the cortex, the parcellation that's come from the work of David Van Essen and Matt Glasser through the Human Connectome Project. Uh, this was a multimodal imaging project that ultimately has led to a parcellation scheme that seems to be very robust across individuals. And so we want to be able to use that to drive the sampling of uh, characterizing these different regions. Now, the, bringing the monkey into this affords the opportunity to approach the functional parcellation that I was describing before. Uh, Vinrich Freibold from Rockefeller University 
spent his career really trying to define where these different functional regions are in individual macaque monkeys. For example, uh, face responsive regions can be mapped in individual uh, monkeys, but they're variable enough between individuals that you can't predict where they are. <clears throat> so we want to be able to use an individual animal that's had its function characterized for a variety of different um, functions and behaviors, <clears throat> and then use that as the basis for a sampling strategy to really understand what the basis of these functional uh, organizations are. And really, of course, we'd love to be doing this in human because this is the ultimate target. And uh, so we have another effort within this project led by Nancy Kenwisher at MIT to try to do the same thing in human where we can start to think about um, regions subserving human specific functions such as language or speech perception or even thinking about other people's thoughts. These are regions that can be defined with function localizing stimuli <clears throat> in a human individual. Um, and she had uh, an example of being able to get a donor uh, to volunteer in a terminal end of life situation to undergo a functional imaging battery to be able to map these before. So um, we're trying to take this on and this is really the heroic work of, of Dirk and Kimmy DeMoto Riley, Christine McDonald, Tim, um, Tim Brown, to try to set up a, a hospice program here in Seattle where we could recruit donors in end of life situations um, to, uh, to be willing to uh, both undergo a, a function localizing a set of stimuli with an MRI and then donate their brains to this project. So this is a, a long-term sort of thing, but really if we're going to understand these types of things, we have to be willing to try to push the boundaries on what we're doing in human neuroscience. We wanna understand the organization behind functional organization of the human brain <clears throat> and therefore downstream what might go wrong in disease. Uh, it's really important to try to achieve these things. <clears throat> so um, that's really kind of the, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so these these things have sort of, this is the plan of how we would get um, specimens and sampling plans, but it really sort of leaves open the problem of <clears throat> how will we actually do this? How will we, we be able to map brains into the same framework as imaging to be able to drive this sort of strategy? And here again, I'm calling out Dirk many times here because he's so instrumental in all these things. Um, um, Dirk and his colleagues have really been trying to, again, reinvent how post-mortem brain preparation is done to allow these types of things. And this has really required kind of going back to the drawing board a little bit on, on doing this, where we need to be able to register a post-mortem brain up into the volumetric space of, of a functional MRI-based template system so that we can do this mapping. And uh, the strategy for doing this is to do very careful photo documentation of slabs, but also either the surface of the brain or even a short MR that can be done with a tabletop scanner prior to slabbing up the brain that allows you to have good images of the brain that can be reconstructed into a volume that can then be mapped into the space. And so this involves um, other colleagues as well, for example, Eugenio Iglesias and Bruce Fischel, um, who can take this low resolution scan and use machine learning approaches to turn that into a, a higher resolution synthetic MR that then can be registered into the MR space. And by doing that, you're now able to project the parcellation scheme from one of these templates, like the human connectome template, back onto the slabs. So at the end of the day, you end up with a brain whose slabs are annotated accurately with these parcels uh, from the MR templates. And so that can then be used to, to drive this sort of sampling. And we're really trying to get this into production on this so that we can sample very accurately because what happens right now for the most part is you have slabs of frozen brain and an anatomist looks at it and tries to make a call about what some region is and it's just not very accurate. <clears throat> to give you just a, a quick teaser on what this looks like, um, I think Christine was involved with this as well. Um, here is a, on the left-hand side, an in cranio um, low-res MR. The machine learning approaches can create the synthetic MR, and then you can now apply parcellation uh, onto that by registration into the free surface system. That can then be uh, projected back down onto the slabs of the brain. So, uh, so really, this, this seems like a very feasible approach to be able to do, and one that I think can be implemented across many sites now. So another effort that 
that's been happening in BICAN that Dirk has been having a heavy hand in as well, is to try to standardize the methods that will allow this type of thing across brain banks. <clears throat> so within the system, both the neurobank, neurobiobank, you see Irvine and all the neuro um, um, and the UW um, have agreed on a set of specifications to better prepare these specimens and to capture sufficient information that these brains could be mapped into this system. And I think this is really key to be sort of changing the culture of how this is done to be um, allowing the brain banking that's happening across the community to be able to take advantage of all of these advances in the atlasing realm to be able to map into the same system so that they can um, correlate their data with it. Okay, <clears throat> getting down to the final sampling. Sorry, this is a bit of a long description, but I really just kind of want to show you what's coming. Um, we're now beginning the actual work of sampling across the brain. Um, this involves a combination of uh, using these sampling uh, strategies I've just described in the cortex, um, sampling larger subcortical regions. And then uh, when we get down into, into very complex deep brain structures, to actually capture everything, we end up actually cubing up the brain, essentially. And so we, we need to cover the entire brain in order to capture all the cells. And then we can map those with a secondary technique, like a, a spatial technique. And the spatial techniques have really come a long way. They're now at the point where they can be applied, given sufficient resources, to large brains. And so, uh, for example, there's a technique called Murfish that, um, that allows you to to map with very fine cellular resolution with a big multiplex assay uh, that we can apply to, uh, to a, a marmoset or a macaque brain sort of systematically, comprehensively, and in a more targeted way in, in the human. But right now, um, you know, the, the, the platform only allows something like a square centimeter of a thin section. So how do you do that across a big brain? You have to slab it, you tile it, and then you systematically section through there and have uniform sampling. So we'll have a, a coverage of the entire brain at this extremely high resolution mapped into the same space as this functional organization that lets us ask the relationship between these things. Okay, um, so that's that's really um, what I want to describe on the method, but really to tell you what's, what's coming then for the field is that um, it really is like the genome. And the output of this will be this classification, which we intend to turn into a formal classification a la the genome. It's a complete description of the system. Uh, there will be versions of this, just like the human genome. There will be formal nomenclatures. We'll have tools to visualize the reference. We'll have tools like BLAST. BLAST was transformative for genomics. We'll have these kinds of tools to be able to take anybody else's single cell data, map against it, and transfer labels onto their own data sets, and a knowledge base to organize information around these like we have in the genome. And there, I just want to end this part saying that this really is the aspiration, that this effort will create these foundational references, common coordinate frameworks, a formal uh, cell classification that can serve the whole community. And the purpose of this is really not to serve just the genomist community, but to serve all aspects of this, the disease consortia, um, and the imaging uh, field, the cellular uh, circuit and systems field, driving other big initiatives as well and connecting with the rest of the body. Okay, um, I, wanna, I wanna move now to things that one can do with this atlas. So it's nice to have this description, but one thing that came out of this atlas that I think was a little bit um, unexpected at the time is that we're able to, to mine these data to not only describe the cells and selective gene expression, but the regulatory machinery behind why there is cell type selective gene expression. It turns out that the technique of a tax seek, a tax seek is a method that looks at the state of the chromatin and particularly regions of the chromatin that are accessible or open. Most DNA is bound up tightly in the nucleus and it's not accessible in any given cell, but parts of it are open and those tend to be the active regions, either genes that are being actively used or regulatory domains responsible for regulating those genes or turning on those genes. With these single cell data now, it turns out that um, you can map at the level of cell types and you can look for putative regulatory domains, which are regions of the chromatin that are open only in certain kinds of cells. And so imagine now we have the entire brain 
reference with this kind of data for every kind of cell. And so we can mine these data now, identify these, these putative regulatory elements, and we can start to test them and see whether they're actually regulatory elements. We built a system now for being able to, uh, to take these, package them into a virus, into an AV, uh, the same type of AV that's in wide use in gene therapy, um, test these in a mouse, and then if they're really um, functional and give um, interesting or useful patterns, we can then move into primates and test them, or even in human. Um, and so just to give you an idea, um, there's been a lot of events on the capsid, whoops, capsid side of this as well <clears throat> that allow you now to have blood-brain barrier crossing uh, viruses in, in mouse at least, where you can do a retroorbital injection of a high titer virus. It gets um, all across the brain. It transduces most of the cells. And now whether a gene is turned on is solely under the control of this, these regulatory elements, which I'll call enhancers here. They're distal regulatory elements or enhancers. So here are a few examples of this. On the left is a panneuronal. Uh, so you can see like basically every cell gets transduced um, and turns on in the context of a panneuronal enhancer in the middle. Now we go to just four brain GABAergic cells. So every cell got transduced. The gene is only turned on in that. And you can start to get to very, very specific patterns. Here's just CA2 pyramidal cells in, in one of these examples. So just to sort of make a long story short here, um, this seems to work really broadly. And we can now use our knowledge of the cellular architecture to systematically create tools to target these different kinds of cells. To give you an idea, uh, of, of this here is a, a set of tools for the striatum where you know a lot is known about the different cellular circuit components. There are, are medium spiny neurons that are either part of the direct pathway or the indirect pathway. There are various types of inhibitory neurons, cholinergic or somatostatin or parvalbumin. We can de derive tools to selectively target any one of these components alone. These can then be combined if we'd like, uh, for example. Um, and the, the specificity with these is just remarkable. In many cases, the enhancers are way more express, uh, sensitive and selective than a gene. So genes tend to be a bit promiscuous, but these regulatory elements may be active only in a single, single kind of cell in the entire brain. So for example, this movie is showing just striatal expression based on one of these. So keep in mind, this is delivered by a virus that goes everywhere, but it's just restricted to uh, the target. So um, we can improve these over nature. <clears throat> so often we would do a screen and you have specificity, but you don't have, um, it's not really that robust, but it turns out that that can be improved. We can optimize these things, uh, most notably by concatamerizing them. You can put a bunch of copies together and improve their expression levels. Many of these work across species. Um, and so uh, it, we can take a human sequence, screen in a mouse, <clears throat> and then when we come back into a monkey, for example, um, very often that cellular specificity is preserved with those enhancers. And so we can, we can really make um, enhancers that, that they're actually useful for mouse, <clears throat> but where they're transformative is their application to get cell type specific genetic access to particular cell populations in primates and likely in humans. So um, I discussed some of this the last time, but I, what I'd like to really kind of highlight is um, we've extended this program recently uh, through collaborations and other internal work to really try to show that you can get meaningful expression and these can be used fruitfully across species. So uh, through a collaboration with David Fitzpatrick, um, uh, we've been trying to demonstrate that some of these tools could be used in non-traditional species and to drive functional transgenes to the point that you could do experimental neuroscience. So for example, here is a layer four excitatory neuron enhancer that was, that was found in the mouse and validated in a monkey, now used in a ferret. Um, and in this case, the, the cellular specificity for these layer four neurons is conserved across the species. And now you can start to hook up functional transgenes to these. So here, for example, is starting to allow um, calcium imaging with GCAMPs. So GCAMP6 was put under the control of, of this enhancer 
put into this ferret just in the layer four cells. And now you can start to image spontaneous activity in just that cell population, just like you would be able to do in, in a mouse with a transgenic um, animal. Another example here, um, we have been able to move down to this finest of cell type level. Here's a chandelier cell enhancer. Then you can see the cartridges actually here in this in fluorescent image on the left. The chandelier cells have these remar remarkably elaborate axonal uh, um, uh, cartridges, they're called, as they're connecting to the axon initial segments of the pyramidal neurons. We have tools that can target them. We can put GCAM under the control of these, and now you can get uh, either spontaneous or evoked responses from those. So um, not only can we target um, parts of the brain, we can target um, other parts of the CNS or even the body, as I'll describe. Um, and now we're starting to think about how these could really be clinically valuable assets where there are vulnerable cell populations in different degenerative diseases, for example, where we know that particular uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord uh, may be lost in disease, such as ALS. Um, and we can target those and create specific tools for those particular populations that you can imagine could be used for selective therapies. So anywhere we have this data, we're able to mine for these enhancers. In this particular case, uh, we went looking for motor neurons in the, in the spinal cord. We're able to identify enhancers that can derive selective expression in a mouse, test this in a monkey, has similar specificity. Now you might want to even target multiple types. For example, um, upper and lower motor neurons are affected in ALS. And um, so in, in, in um, initially, we had tools to target one or the other. We can either target the upper motor neurons or the lower motor neurons. It turns out that these regulatory elements are kind of independent units, and they can be combined like Legos in these, uh, in these tools. So in this particular example, we can take an upper motor neuron enhancer, a lower motor neuron enhancer, put them in the same construct, and now we get a single construct that has the, the combined activity in upper and lower motor neurons. So I want to just, um, oh, sorry, one last thing I wanted to mention. This is not brain specific. It turns out that presumably any other organ system in the body can be done the same way. We recently had a reason to go after a heart specific enhancer. Uh, there's whole body data of this type available now, and we could develop something which really selectively targets the heart and not other organs. So I want to take just a minute to reflect on what I just told you here. You know, this opens up immense possibilities. So why does neuroscience focus on the mouse? It's because it's a genetically tractable system that, that many tools have been built, built around. Um, and you can take advantage of all those tools to do particular kinds of neuroscience. However, the state of the field is that we use the mouse for everything because it's the only available model system for doing it. If you have these tools, you can target the right model for the thing you're trying to study. You probably wouldn't study vision in a mouse. Mice don't really use vision that much. Um, so you can pick the system that you want, and now you can use these tools at this fine circuit level sort of resolution with these types of tools. At the same time, these have obvious clinical implications for precision medicine. We can now target essentially any kind of cell in the brain or the body with these types of tools. And so you can imagine now that you know, most of the gene therapy field which uses these exact kinds of viruses is non-specific gene replacement at the moment. And this leads to all sorts of off-target effects. You have toxicity in the DRGs, in the liver, things like this. Um, these are alleviated by having selective um, gene activation only in the kinds of cells that you want. <clears throat> so I just like to leave this as a promissory note, but something which directly comes from these atlases is that this is no longer a look but don't touch. This is now driving the development of tools for precision medicine. Okay, um, I'm just very, very briefly, I think I'm trying to cover too much here. 
these also have tools, uh, uh, applications in the in the basic science realm. Um, we can we can now uh, use these as part of our functional characterization of cell types. We have this technique of patch seek. Patch seek is patch plant physiology combined with sequencing of the cells. This is a way to annotate the cells in these molecular classifications. And you know this has really been work that has been essentially driven by collaboration with all of our colleagues here. Um, also, we've been doing this as a collaboration globally with others in the community uh, that can have access to human neurosurgical tissues and do uh, characterization of the basic properties of cells. Um, I've shown this many times. Um, we're able to take these surgical resections, uh, do thin sections of the uh, thin slabs of these. We can do uh, this patch clamp technique, which allows us to get three data modalities, the physiological properties, the molecular or the morphological properties and the molecular properties. And so we're really able to get down to this fine level of what these different kinds of cells are. This is now being expanded in this, in this, um, uh, this new brain initiative project to be a cross species approach. And that's important because um, it's wonderful what we can do in a human, but it's fundamentally based, um, limited to the cortex. And with a monkey, uh, we can do this um, more reliably in any part of the brain. And um, this is work that's enabled by our access to tissues from the local National Primate Research Center. We've now expanded this consortium to bring in colleagues from the Baylor College of Medicine. They have access to tissue from the Southwest National Primate Research Center. And we're able to then um, really start to tackle systematically mapping across this molecular classification to add uh, this information. Also want to mention we can use these tools now. So we can, we can keep those tissues alive in culture long enough to be able to apply these viruses and selectively label different kinds of cells that label allow us to be very targeted in this analysis. Just to give you a quick idea, um, in the cortex, what initially seemed like a hopeless task, there are almost 50 types of GABAergic interneurons in the cortex. Over the span of a few years, working with tissue from, from all of you, um, and these viral tools that allow us to target the GABAergic cells, we've actually been able to get representation of all of one of these types uh, in this reference. So when you have a, a target and you have the tools and you have the tissue, you can actually deal with this complexity. Um, I also want to point out that um, you know, this is really allowing us to do very pioneering research for types of cells that have really not been accessible without this kind of, of access. So for example, we have uh, tools that allow more selective targeting than just GABAergic cells, we can go for VIP GABAergic neurons <clears throat> and start to characterize these bipolar neurons, various other kinds with this, with this genetic targeting. We can target um, really specialized types of cells that are only found in human <clears throat> for now that we have the tools and we're ready. So for example, with a, a rare um, tissue from the cingulate cortex, um, we've been able to target the von Economo neurons and show that these are uh, of a type of cell called layer 5 ET or deep projecting cells and have some of the very first real characterizations of these highly specialized human specific types of cells. Um, the molecular classification is sort of driving where there are interesting things to look at. Um, we've been looking across different parts of the cortex and it turns out that in humans, the primary visual cortex is incredibly specialized. It's unlike every other part of the cortex. Of course, you can see this uh, histologically. It turns out to be the case molecularly that there are actually are different kinds of cells in primary visual cortex from all other regions of the cortex. And you can see this very, very clearly from the transcriptional data. And uh, Ben Granum uh, uh, really provided a few remarkably unique cases of occipital cortex that contain some primary visual cortex. And we are ready to go and we're able to do a lot with these. And this is sort of a message that I'd like to convey that with these kinds of maps as, uh, um, as the foundation, we can do a lot with these cases and really open up new areas that have never been possible in human. So in this particular case, these are the first ever uh, V1 cases that have been available for these sorts of techniques. Uh, we've been able to really go to town of um, looking with acute tissues, with um, cultured tissues, putting viruses onto these so that we can target different kinds of cells. 
And we've been able to target some of the places where there appear to be V1 specific cell populations, uh, such as uh, layer four of the cortex and different types of interneurons. So this is very much a work in progress uh, that we're, we're trying to analyze these, map against this reference, but, um, but really highlights you know, how much there is to learn and what a good place we are in uh, to be able to, uh, to open up an understanding of the human brain with these types of techniques. Okay, um, I'd like to close the talk, um, moving into uh, translational studies, um, in particular, the Seattle Alzheimer's Disease Brain Cell Atlas Project, or CAD, um, which is a, an effort in collaboration with um, the University of Medicine, um, as well as uh, Kaiser Permanente with their Adult Changes in Thought program. And there's a very close collaboration uh, with Dirk Keen and Tom Grabowski. Um, and the, the idea behind this project is to take advantage of these atlases and these remarkable new tools to really try to dive deep and get a much better understanding of the cellular and molecular basis of Alzheimer's pathology and the progression of that disease so that we might be able to identify some of the earlier causal events. Um, this is really a, a fabulous collaboration between our institutes. <clears throat> and again, you can see this is sort of a team science approach. We really need a highly multidisciplinary approach uh, to tackle these very complex subjects. In this case, um, and, and many of our people at the Allen Institute have been involved in basic brain research, now applying their skills to Alzheimer's. And on the UW side, their fabulous colleagues here, Dirk, Tom, um, uh, Paul Crane, uh, Christine McDonald, uh, as well as colleagues at, at Kaiser, uh, Eric Larson was really involved in the genesis of this project as well. So the idea behind this project was, was to bring these tools and to sort of marry a more traditional neuropath-based understanding of Alzheimer's pathology and progression with this new high-resolution molecular set of techniques and knowledge. And we can ask questions such as, what kinds of cells at this level of fine resolution are selectively vulnerable or affected in disease? Um, can we bring the tools of trajectory analysis to try to understand the progression of disease and thereby model what some of the earliest events are? And now understand what molecular things are, are perturbed, but in which populations. And so really get a much better idea of the targets where the action is that, um, that should be where we're looking in the disease, um, or they might actually present new targets such as for gene therapy, as I just described, the tools are there if we can ident identify the right targets. So <clears throat> at a glance, um, the, the sort of idea behind this, uh, this effort is to systematically collect a set of data on a cohort of individuals. We've looked at about 84 individuals across the spectrum of pathology. And this is really sort of a key aspect that this is not a case control approach. This is understanding that there is a progression of disease severity that can be seen in the, in the amount of pathology. And this is a continuous variable. And so we're trying to model this as a continuous progression of increasing severity. Um, to measure that requires um, uh, using immunohistochemistry for uh, pathology associated markers, uh, such as uh, A beta, phospho tau, uh, and other markers. On, then we take tissues at the Allen Institute and we profile them with these techniques of RNA seq or attack seq, or now the methods have been combined. So the commercial product of this is called multi ohm that allows you to do both at the same time. And then finally, to bring these spatial methods on so that we can really understand what's happened at a fine tissue organization level, where are the cells that are affected and what are the relationships to one another? So um, this has been really very successful. Um, Dirk and his colleagues have been able to institute a, a quantitative neuropathology where these image-based um, uh, data sets are, are uh, segmented and quantified using machine learning approaches to really capture the, the disease burden and then we've been able to use that suite of, of quantitative pathology uh, uh, information to create or model a progression, a pseudo progression of disease that really is modeling this disease severity or the burden of pathology, but is attempting to model that there is a continuous progression uh, over time. And this seems to, this, this pseudo trajectory corresponds quite well with, uh, with cognitive scores and with more uh, qualitative uh, pathology staging. 
Um, <clears throat> on the cell type side, we've now been able to, um, to take this enormous data set now of single cell uh, transcriptomics or multiomics on this Alzheimer's cohort and um, map these against the reference. And not only uh, have we been able to map against the reference, but we've been able to add to the reference because uh, we have a much bigger data set. We have more coverage of things like non-neuronal cells. And it turns out that there are uh, disease-specific states that can be defined, uh, particularly for uh, microglia or astrocytes. So this is an embellished AD-specific reference classification that captures that whole spectrum of, of cell types and states. <clears throat> And so this turns into, you know, it's, it's really quite complex. It's a resolution that we've never had before. <clears throat> about, um, about 140 types of cells can now be characterized in each one of these individuals, and we can see how they change as a function of disease. So one of the first questions that we can ask is, <clears throat> are there certain types of cells that are affected in disease or vulnerable in disease? And by vulnerable, I mean that there is a loss of those cells as a function of disease severity. And by affected, I mean, there might be an increase in certain states of cells um, or, or, or relative proportions of cells that one would anticipate would happen sort of in non-neuronal cells. And what I'm showing here is now looking across this 139 cell types, on the left-hand side are the effect sizes of losses of certain kinds of cells. On the right-hand side, you see certain kinds of, of um, non-neuronal cells actually increase. Um, and uh, as a function of either cognitive status or the ADNC criteria, which is um, a more of a, a qualitative staging. Now, if we bring in this continuous uh, pseudo trajectory that we've created, we see a similar thing, but the effect sizes get significantly larger. So accounting for the actual quantitative burden of pathology gives a much more robust effect. And what you can see is that many cell types are affected, but it's also quite selective. And in particular, certain kinds of the excitatory cells in the green excitatory neurons are affected. You can see this group, these correspond to the upper layer of supergranular cortical cortical cells or IT in the, in the language of these cell types. On the more left-hand side, certain kinds of interneurons are also affected and, and selectively lost as a function of disease. On the right-hand side, you can also see a uh, recapitulation of what's been seen in the literature. There are disease-associated astrocytes and microglia, uh, which have been well-described that we can see uh, very well here at two, but they're very specific types. So it's not all astrocytes or all microglia, it's very specific states of these cells. So um, what we can also do is to use this modeling of trajectory to understand the sequence of events that happens. And here things start to get even more interesting. Uh, so for example, on the non-neuronal side, we see that the astrocytes and microglia are affected early and they increase in their proportions um, uh, over time, uh, over increasing severity, sorry. On the neuronal side on the left, uh, what I think was expected is this loss of the neurons. And so that these upper layer neurons are lost in this green bar, um, but it happens very late. And it turns out that the earlier events on the, on the loss of cells is on the inhibitory neuron side, and particularly on the somatostatin interneuron side of things. So this is really quite an unexpected thing to see that, that the interneurons are affected first. Um, and now we can bring uh, our understanding of what these cell populations are to start to think about this more deeply. So it's not all somatostatin cells that are affected. In fact, there are somatostatin and parvalbumin cells that are affected, but it's specific types of those cells that are affected. And now we can tie into the, the knowledge base of the, of the cell classification to show that it's very specific types of these cells. It's double bouquet cells, for example, uh, that are really a, a primate specific type of cell that are lost, certain kinds of basket cells. So I won't go into detail because I'm out of, out of time here, but just to say that um, we can now really begin to interpret these cellular uh, consequences at this level of resolution that one would see in a model organism. We can talk about things at the level of specific certain circuit components that are lost. And then finally, just to say that the spatial methods are adding a lot here as well. We're able to confirm these sorts of effects. We're able to show that the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory neurons that are lost are both in the upper layers of the cortex intermingled with one another. 
So this is probably a causal chain of events. You lose the inhibitory neurons, which provide uh, inhibition onto the excitatory neurons. Ultimately, that's deleterious for the excitatory neurons and they're lost too. So let me just uh, close by saying that um, this was just the first brain region. This project is really trying to take advantage of this whole atlas now to be able to map trajectories across regions. Alzheimer's, of course, is a progressive disease and we can map how things are changing uh, over the full course of disease as they progress across the brain. So I just want to say at the end, all of these data that I've discussed are all public. They're all in resources. This is meant to be catalytic. So I'm showing you sort of ways to use the data, but it's all there for you to use as well. With that, I really like to acknowledge a bunch of people. It's very hard to acknowledge the group of people involved with this. All of our, my colleagues here in the department um, and in DLMP, um, very many colleagues with this new BICAM project, and of course our, our team at the Allen Institute and our funding support from NIMH, NIH, uh, and other sources. And with that, uh, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention. That was uh, amazing. We're all standing, there's a standing ovation, um, trying to follow Ed, the breath and uh, depth of what you talked about. Um, let me start off with one question you kind of um you kind of covered it a little uh about uh, and i know it's very pedestrian but i have to ask it anyway um when you're doing this uh, the single cell work the the sampling how do you deal with the sampling error that occurred i assume that there's a wide spectrum of even in the same neurons what you see um yeah so you know, the, the benefit of these techniques is that you're measuring many, many cells of each type. And so, um, you know, the, the type of classification I've been telling you about it, at this level, things are, are pretty robust and they're discrete enough that you can map against them. Within each type, there's quite a bit of variation. And, yeah. and often that's biologically meaningful variation. Um, so, so we're actually looking, we're looking for that. But it, it turns out that that is, Sort of relatively minor compared to this sort of typology and so you can okay. map the types pretty robustly and then you know that then you have to interpret what the within type variation means you know it, and that's that's complex it sometimes it can be technical um sometimes it's biological and sometimes uh, what appears to be technical turns out to be biological um so well i, I mentioned that in particular because something i didn't tell you about the alzheimer's study is that uh, a small set of the high path cases looked like they were low quality. So they the, the QC was off and we almost threw them out of the study. And then we realized like, well, we should check against the clinical history of these individuals, which is a real advantage of working with these longitudinal studies. And it turns out that those, those ones that had particularly low quality um, had steeper cognitive decline late in life. Mm. And so it really actually looks like that low quality is, this is a, this is a biological phenotype of disease. Like, the cells are shutting down, and it turns out that they had, you know, lower gene detection. Um, the chromatin state was more condensed. These are unhealthy cells, and so that's an example where, you know, there's variation, but it turns out to be, you know, biologically meaningful. Sometimes it's not. But. Yeah, that's very helpful. I didn't really. In each cell type, there's less variation than there is between the cell types. So that's great. That's what I was getting at. Thank you very much.